Hi, everyone. It's great to be here, even remotely. Thanks to Mike for inviting me and everyone else who works behind the scenes here to make chapels happen. I know that in these COVID days, their work is truly behind the scenes. I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about myself, since many of you may not know who I am. I'm a Talbot grad and have been teaching at Biola since 1999, which I know is probably before some of you were born. Um, as Mike mentioned, I teach classes like biblical interpretation and spiritual formation and 1 Corinthians. I'm married. I have two great stepdaughters, and I also have the cutest granddaughter in the world. I love dogs and walking on the beach, and I am also a lousy debater. About that last point, I wanted to mention that because it has to do with what I want to talk about today. The reason I'm a lousy debater is that when I get into an argument, which is generally not very often, because as a lousy debater, I generally try to avoid them, I can get thrown off um, in the debate mode when someone else makes a good point. In a debate, I know you're supposed to focus on your side and refute the points your opponent is making, but I'm more the kind of person who will listen to someone's point and go, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it. Thanks for mentioning that. And then I realize, oh, I guess I'm not supposed to do that. So you probably don't want me on your side if you have a big debate coming up. However, I like to think that that's not always a negative characteristic and that there are positives to that as well. Deborah Tannen, who teaches at Georgetown University, wrote a book called The Argument Culture, in which she talked about the downsides of how we often approach conversations as debates. She says that our culture is permeated by a pervasive, warlike atmosphere that makes us approach public dialogue and just about anything we need to accomplish as if it were a fight. While she acknowledges that such an approach is useful in the right context, it has become exaggerated to the point where it gets in the way of, sol it gets in the way of solving problems rather than aiding. The assumption is that opposition is the most desirable option with the result that tools such as cooperation and agreement are too often overlooked and undervalued. She suggests that other means such as exploring, expanding, discussing, investigating, and the exchanging of ideas may yield more fruitful results in some endeavors. Interestingly, she wrote this back in 1998, and I wonder what she would say about how things have progressed today. What I want to share today are some moments when I learned that I need to expand my way of thinking and how I think it connects with what I've studied in the New Testament. As we are painfully aware of, topics such as race and cultural humility are extremely explosive. And I suspect many of us might be looking for another way to approach the conversation, if we can even call it a conversation right now. To give you a little preview, I think the way to approach cultural humility, the topic of this week, is simply to think about humility, that in Christ, we are all called to honor everyone. This is something that in recent years has really hit home for me, especially in, how, in what I expect from myself. I've had to think about how I respond to how people treat me and how I think I should treat others. So to start, um, when I was growing up in northern Minnesota, my family was pretty much the only non-white family in that part of the state. One question I heard time and again was, so where are you from? I learned quickly that people didn't want an answer like Minnesota or Hibbing, which was the town where I lived. They would keep pressing, no, where are you from? As if surely I couldn't be from somewhere in the United States. They were only satisfied once I said something about my parents being born in Korea. Even though my siblings and I were born in America, we weren't thought of as being from the United States like my white classmates. But since we certainly weren't from Korea either, that meant we didn't belong anywhere. I grew up dreading and hating that question, along with its sister statement, your English is really good. Since these were constant reminders that other people didn't think we belonged, that we would always be considered foreigners, even though we grew up here. And it irritated, it, it irritated me, and I was angry at those who insisted on reminding me that I didn't fit in. But later in life, something happened that gave me a different perspective. One day when I was a graduate student in Indiana, a friend and I were in a local shop where the owner was clearly not white. My friend who really enjoys meeting new people and learning about new cultures went up to him and asked, so where are you from? I was horrified that she had asked a forbidden question, but to my astonishment, the man was delighted at what she had done. 
having recently arrived from G Egypt, he went on to tell my friend story after story about the country he loved. And in the end, he even thanked her for being interested in where he was from. What this taught me was that I needed to have more grace with other people. When you meet someone, you can't immediately tell just from looking at them if there is someone who will be hurt and offended if you ask where they are from or delighted you are interested in their background. And I began to realize this puts other people in an unfair position of having to guess if you'll be offended if they ask a question or offended if you don't. I also realized I was placing a lot of attention on me and thinking about other people in terms of the way they impacted me and less about how I might impact them. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, Paul says some important things about the unity of the body of Christ. He says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member rejoices, all the members rejoice with it. So if someone is hurting, then we should empathize with them, understand them. But it's also important to take this verse with what comes before it, where he says that the members may have the same care for one another or equal concern. What I began to realize was that in seeing myself as a suffering member, wanting others to listen to my suffering, I wasn't doing it in the context of having the same care for everyone. I wanted other people to care for me, but in the process, I neglected my own responsibility to care for others. In other words, I made myself the center of the universe. I did this because in some way, I had fallen for a lie. Then in order to say that my experience was legitimate, that it was truly harmful and hurtful, other people not only had to see it and agree with me, but they had to focus on me. My suffering was a showstopper. But I had forgotten something very important. The whole passage takes place in the context of all of 1 Corinthians 12, which says we are all members of Christ's body. At any time, there are other members who are suffering for any number of reasons. Am I paying attention to them? Or am I only caught up in my own suffering? Even in terms of race or culture, my focus on getting my needs met was causing me to neglect needs of others. My experiences with my husband, who is white, showed me how I wasn't following all of 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26. When we first started dating, I would tell him of my experiences, the racial slurs, the subtle put downs, the being in restaurants as we watched other people get seated while we waited and finally got a table in the back by the restrooms. While he did try hard to listen to me, I didn't think he gave me the sympathy I thought was warranted, which upset me. And then he had the gall to talk about things he had experienced being white. I couldn't believe he was actually saying these things to me, and especially after not giving me what I thought was a proper support and empathy for me because of what I had told him. However, an interesting thing happened. As the months went by, I began to look a little more, more closely at some of the things he had talked about. In particular, I noticed the commercials on TV. Time and time again, there was a commercial which showed the white dad as being clueless and incompetent, who needed to be rescued by his all-knowing and all-powerful wife. Um, and his children were also much wiser than he was, and even the family dog knew more of what was going on than he did. After a seemingly endless stream of these commercials, I had to admit to myself, well, I guess that would bother me too. So I became a little bit more sympathetic to his experiences and less consumed with mine. My intense focus on myself had blinded me from seeing things from his perspective. Somehow, I had believed that because I considered my experience legitimate, that his were, well, not relevant. I may not have been consciously thinking that way, but that's what was revealed in my actions. And the more I thought about what it would be like to see things from his perspective, I began to see more of what I had done. Somehow, in thinking about my own situation, I had closed myself off to other perspectives. I saw that I had fallen for the lie that seeing from someone else's perspective would weaken, diminish, or even delegitimize my own. I think that is a funda fundamental lie that causes great damage. The main point is not that one member, me, um, is suffering. The main point is that we are all in Christ and that in the body, some members are suffering. The point is not me, but Christ, the one I belong to, the one we all belong to. And in Christ, we are able to relate to each other, some of whom are suffering. Starting with the in Christ portion, I believe is critical because without it, I can fall into making myself the center of the universe, no matter which member I am. 
once I began to see Christ as a center of all of us, I began to see more. I saw friends whose voices were silenced just because they were white. I saw others who were told that they should be ashamed of who they were just because they were white. And I thought, that doesn't sound like Christ's body. we all have the same care for one another. But what would it look like to have the same care for one another? To Paul, it's very simple. As he says in Philippians 2, 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And right before this, he says, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This is Paul's call to everyone, not just whites, not just Asians, not just blacks, not just Hispanics. Having the same care means everyone looks to the interests of others. It's the same care because it follows the example of Christ. And it is certainly no coincidence that Paul follows his instructions on the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12 with his famous chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. But here's the catch. Because we are different, the specific examples of the same care might look different. According to Paul, the body is asymmetrical. At one point, one part is hurting. At another point, one is honored. The same care is meeting people where they are. In the body, the foot has a different experience than the hand. The lowly foot, because it's at the bottom of the body, might not think it's very important. Hidden from view, getting dirty and tired after walking all day, it laments, I am not a part of the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 15. The head perched high on top of the body where it can see everything in the world might look at the lowly foot and say, I have no need of you. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. So the foot needs to know it belongs and the head needs to honor the foot. So just to clarify, I, I'm not trying to make a direct comparison by saying, you know, trying, I'm not trying to equate one specific group with the foot or another specific group with the head. I'm simply trying to show that care of the different parts by the different parts looks different. And it should, because we are not the same. I often care for my husband in a different way than he cares for me. And it changes over time. Sometimes I need more care. Sometimes he does. But the point is that our care for one another is grounded in our unity as husband and wife. It's about being in tune with one another. Sometimes I need care and my friends give it to me. Sometimes they need care. I might care for them in a certain way, supporting one friend when she loses a job. They might care for me in another, supporting me when my mother is sick. But it is the same care for each other grounded in our friendship. To come back to the example of my husband, he's been learning to have the same care for me. Now when I talk about what it was like to grow up feeling like there's something wrong with you just because of the way you look, or not knowing when a stranger on the street will start mocking you, or to have people talk about what's wrong with your culture because you aren't like everyone else, he listens and tries to understand even if he can't relate from his own experience. I hope we're both learning not to be our own centers of the universe, but to make room for each other. I hope we're learning not to react from simply an either or perspective. As a foot may not know what it's like to be the hand, so does a hand not know what it's like to be the foot. But they do know they are called to be the one body of Christ, which means they are called to care for one another in the way that they are. What's important to remember is that care may not look the same for each part and it shouldn't because we are different. In those situations, the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit is required. I believe it is equally a mistake to gloss over differences and say they don't matter because we're all in Christ. I think Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 12 that our differences and very important, the tensions these differences cause are a critical part of the unique unity of the body of Christ made up of many members. In Ephesians 2, Paul says something remarkable about Jews and Gentiles. He talks about how God has made the two groups one and made peace. In other words, these two groups who were formerly hostile to, to, hostile to one another are reconciled. But these are Jews who looked down on Gentiles for not following God's law. These are Gentiles who were resentful of Jews for claiming that they were superior as God's people. Gentiles had oppressed Jews. Jews had condemned Gentiles. Jew and Greek, with all their history, with all their baggage, with all their hostility and negative feelings to each other, their accusations of superiority and mistreatment by the other are one. And now they are to have the same care for one another. 
So what baggage do we bring to our relationships with one another? What assumptions do we have? What resentments? When, we, when have we been guilty of looking the other way or unfairly making an accusation against someone? I think we can also believe it's a zero-sum game, that there can only be one winner. If I listen to you, then that means I'm wrong. But I think I'm right, so you need to listen to me. And so we fight ferociously for our side and to be the one heard without having to hear the other. Recently, my husband and I faced the very real possibility that we could lose our home in the California wildfires. We had an evacuation order, and the sheriff's deputy came to our home telling us to leave. What struck me during this time was how our neighborhood banded together, talking with each other, having someone going around the neighborhood to see what was happening with the fire up the hill and reporting back to everyone, making an agreement to keep each other informed on what was going on. Different people, different viewpoints, but united in a larger cause and a perspective that transcended our individual homes. Do we know what unites us as Christians? What makes us one while also recognizing that we are very much individuals with different lives, experiences, hurts, fears, and dreams? To be in Christ means neither that my racial identity is a priority nor that it doesn't matter. As a body of Christ, we are grounded in the Lord. Christ died for me as he died for you. I am not the center of the universe, but I serve someone who is. And I serve him by having the same care for the members of his body. Thank you, Dr. Barnwell, for sharing with us. So grateful that you have time to unpack some of this with us. So thank you for being here. Well, first question is this, you know, you talked about um, having the same care um, and equal concern for each other, but you also said that the care looks different or different care. I'd love for you to unpack what the same care and different care look like. Yeah, thanks for asking, because I think that is really important to get. Um, the same care as I see it is, you know, basically Jesus, you know, Philippians 2, yeah. you know, 1 to 4, the idea of not looking to your own interests, but considering the interests of others mm -hmm. and, you know, the whole idea of the example of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus being humble in his position as God, being willing to come down and, you know, serve us in that way. So that's the same care. But the different care is that that type of other centeredness will look different in different in different circumstances. Yeah. So if you were to take maybe the, the metaphor of the body then, so the foot is feeling kind of bad about itself, is feeling kind of lowly, so that maybe the care, the different, the, the same care, which ends up being different care for the foot is, you know, realizing that, you know, the foot needs care in this way. Yeah. Um, maybe the head being on top, not feeling quite the same way. Maybe the head needs to know a little bit more about, you know, being humble to take care of the foot. So, but it's still the, the same care, mm -hmm. you know, same care because it's the example of Jesus, but different yeah. care because you have different members of the body who have yeah. different experiences, different needs. Yeah. And then therefore the general idea of looking to others' interests yep. um, will look differently. Yeah. Thank you. For, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is also, you know, as a person of color, you know, sometimes I feel like my feelings aren't heard by some people. Mm -hmm. And then I think you made it clear that sometimes even as white people, they, yeah. their feelings aren't heard by other people. I guess my question is, when do we fight for our feelings to be validated and where do we learn to lay it down? And, and is there, how do we do that both? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's a really hard question, isn't it? Yeah. Because I think the need to be heard is so central to us. Yeah. I mean, I think it just really goes down. I mean, we all have a need to be heard. And I think it just really goes down to really deep um, uh, feelings of identity. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very difficult. I would say, I think one of the first things is to realize that, you know, ultimately the only person who can really bring healing to that area is the Holy Spirit. And so I think in the first thing we should do would be to ask Jesus as the Holy Spirit to bring healing, you know, in those areas. That should be the first one we think about. But on the other hand, I think um, it also is different in different contexts. Um, you know, for example, as we're trying to sort of balance the need to hear versus, um, you know, being heard. I would say for, you know, someone else, for someone in my position yep. where I'm older, you know, I'm you know, talking about these things, I've had time to, you know, process some things that I feel like in maybe in day to day interactions, it's maybe not my, you know, maybe not the best thing for me to, you know, feel offended when everything comes in and, you know, or, you know, thinking about how the ho I should maybe think about how the Holy Spirit helps me yeah. in that. So I would say maybe in someone in my position, um, maybe I need to maybe part of my responsibility is 
you know, working a little harder, perhaps, you know, and to see how the Holy Spirit will help me and not, you know, fighting to be heard in every situation yeah. um, in that. But also realizing that, you know, again, the different members are in different situations. Yeah. You know, when I think about, you know, someone who's very young growing up, like a situation where, where I was at, I mean, that's a situation where it really would be helpful if someone would have come along and maybe helped me, mm-hmm. you, know, in, you know, in that regard. I think then I had a greater need Mm. you know, to be heard. Yeah. So I think we have to kind of think in some ways there's this discernment that comes up mm-hmm. because of different situations, different contexts, where a person is at. I think we all have a, you know, the opportunity for the Holy Spirit, yep. you know, to help us. But, and I would also say we also have the opportunity to be that person who hears someone. Yeah. Too. No, I love that. I, I love how messy that answer is in some <laughs> sense. And I, that's not an attack mm-hmm. on you. It's mm-hmm. uh, what I'm saying is, this is such a hard topic and it's so mm-hmm. different. And again, the different body parts and the different ways we interact, it's so different all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And so I love the richness of the messiness actually. And so I guess my question is, you, you do talk about uh, the need for diversity and unity. Mm-hmm. It's a both and world. Um, but you know, there's so many of us who live in like the either or world and that's just so cleaner. It's just so much easier and it's mm-hmm. just, so much more productive even. Um, how do we get some of the either or people yeah. uh, to understand that we got to live in this both and messiness? Yeah. Well, I think for all of us, I mean, we're all, you know, we're all after truth, right? And yeah. our goal is to glorify God. And yeah. I think maybe as we're thinking about that larger perspective, you know, that helps. Um, because when we're grounded in that, we realize that, you know, learning something new isn't, necessarily a threat to us. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we should be open. You know, if I'm wrong, I want to know that I'm wrong. Um, but it could just be something that I learned something that adds to my perspective mm. or enriches my perspective. Mm. And I think when we realize that it's not an all or nothing, you know, the either or mm-hmm. that again, there might be something that someone could add to my perspective mm-hmm. and different ways of, of thinking about things. And then maybe this is also where discernment comes in because as I'm thinking about someone's perspective, Again, it's not necessarily an all or nothing. It might be something where, oh, I, I think that what they said really makes sense, but I have a problem here. Yeah. Or it could be, oh, they made a really good point, but you know, I, I'm not sure about their presuppositions here. Yes. You know, in that. So there really is a sense, in particular, as they're thinking about being critical thinkers. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think a part of being a critical thinker is thinking, are there other ways of looking at things? How do we look at what is good about something? How do we look at what some, uh, maybe we don't want to accept? Um, you know, in that regard. And I think just to kind of give an example, because, you know, again, our point is, you know, always to be grounded in the word, right? Yes. And when I think about, you know, the impact of the word um, on me, I'm thinking, well, my example, my experience with my husband. So I learned something, my perspective was expanded because I learned to see a little bit more from his perspective. Mm. But I also realized that I was, you know, I mean, I learned something else too, Mm -hmm. because I think as the word sort of, you know, critiques my experience, or I have the word as a foundation. Mm-hmm. I also realized that I was, you know, too self-centered in my approach. You know, yes. I mean, even though my experience was still real, I don't, you know, I didn't have to give that up. My experience was real. It was yes. harmful. It was hurtful. Yes. But then I realized, but I had become too much the center of the universe. Yeah. So I think there is, a, as you say, part of the messiness, Yeah. you know, in that, as you said, it's, it's much neater, cleaner to do you know, the either or, but when we're talking about, you know, real life <laughs> yep. experiences, people who are very different, then I think uh, some of the messiness just inevitably comes in. Mm-hmm. I, no, I love that. I, you, you said it's not a zero sum game. It's not like just because mm-hmm. you have this, I can't have it. It's like, we're both adding to the fuller picture mm-hmm. of what the body of Christ looks like. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that was clear as you shared is that you've learned to process your own story in a very rich way. And as you've learned to process that, you've, you've looked mm-hmm. at it through the lens of scripture too. If you were to give some advice or if, you, if we were mm-hmm. to understand, how did you learn to process your own story so well? Mm-hmm. And then how, what, what kind of advice would you give to others so that they can process mm-hmm. theirs? Uh, well, I guess a couple of things that, that come to mind is as I've, you know, as, as the years have gone by, um, I also realized that sometimes when I move into different contexts, it sort of highlights something mm-hmm. um, in that. So for example, the whole time I was growing up, um, when I moved out of that, when I went to college and I began to you know, have more friends who were Asian or, or, you know, people of color, then I began to, you know, realize, you know, I mean, kind of, I guess maybe learn more about, you know, I did feel really rejected, you know, growing up. Yeah. Um, but it was just very comforting, you know what I mean? To yeah. sort of, to be, to realize that, 
there wasn't necessarily something wrong with me, mm -hmm. um, that there were other people like me. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to, uh, to do graduate school, I was in Indiana. So this is another, you know, mostly white community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and generally it, was, generally it was fine. But when I came to Biola to interview, mm -hmm. I remember coming off the airplane mm -hmm. and I walked out of, walked into the terminal of LAX mm -hmm. and I just saw the sea of, you know, diverse faces, mm -hmm. you know, in this. And I just remember the feeling that I had was I just felt, I just felt relaxed. You know what I mean, it just like, mm. it was just a, a relief in some ways. And I hadn't realized in some ways that I was, you know, I was feeling that way. So mm. a lot of it is just kind of, you know, as we begin sometimes, you know, when you're in different, different events, experiences, you begin to learn a little bit more yeah. uh, to process this. But I guess I also say too, that one thing that was helpful is, is community. Mm. You know, sometimes, you know, being with people like yourself, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily just race, it could be, you know, anything. It mm -hmm. could be, you know, gender, mm -hmm. or even we talked about clubs here on campus. You know what I mean? If you mm -hmm. like, you know, if you like cheese or something, then you get together <laughs> with a cheese club. Yep. Okay, that there is something that is really nice when you can, you know, process something yep. with people who are, are like you. So that helps. But then I guess if we're talking about both and two, yep. uh, the flip side is also, yes. you know, we want to avoid the, the pitfall of then saying like, well, if my experience is real and I'm processing that, that, that the world doesn't revolve around that. Yes. Um, that really, you know, Christ is the center. So ultimately my theology yep. is what critiques my experience or helps me interpret, yep. you know, my experience. So that was when I learned as I, you know, as I, you know, mentioned that, you know, yeah, my experience is real. My husband's experience is real. Mm -hmm. um, I get critiqued. You know, I, I realize that I'm not the center of the universe, yeah. you know, when I look at scripture. Yeah. You know, uh, at the end, you shared also about how your community came together during the fires that were mm -hmm. threatening your home. And there was so much unity in that. I can't help but think that's not, we don't see that in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as quickly as you can, I know that we could write books about this, but how, what is going on and how mm -hmm. come we don't experience this unif un unification mm -hmm. in the church? Well, I mean, this was one thought I, I, that it might be is I think we're very practical yeah. and we're always kind of looking for the reason for something. And, you know, sometimes we're looking for what works or what, what helps us yes. in that regard. And sometimes I think we just miss that. I think in the new Testament, the idea of the church being unified is itself a good, yes. you know, Paul talks about, we are the body of Christ and he actually equates the members with Christ yes. in first Corinthians eight, uh, 12, he'll say, you know, when you wound your brother, you know, and a sin against them and, you know, hurt their conscience, you sin against Christ yes. or in acts when we read about, you know, the conversion of Saul, um, you know, he hears a voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me yeah. when he's been persecuting the church? Mm -hmm. So there really is just a good for the body of Christ as a church, itself. And I think that's also why we are simply commanded to be unified. And yeah. maybe it's not something that comes naturally to us that we really want to do. But yeah. when you see the commands in scripture to be unified, it does help us realize how important it is. Mm -hmm. And I think a reason why it's important is because of our relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, it's so messy that God knows that the command is needed, that we mm -hmm. need that directive to actually like, no, pursue each other in unity. I yeah. love that. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. Thank yeah. you for your thoughts today. So grateful to, to hear them and unpack uh, cultural humility with us. So thank you for being here with us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.